Okay, good afternoon. I've got a few birthdays this week. People think that because they don't come to church the week before, they won't get sung. Okay. So it was Linda's birthday. It was Robert's birthday on Friday. Thursday. Thursday, okay. And Kevin, are you here? It's your birthday today? No? When? When was your birthday? Next week? Ooh. This? What? After next Sunday? Or in the next few days? After next Sunday. We'll sing happy birthday to you next week then. So we'll sing happy birthday to Linda and happy birthday to Robert. We're going to go slightly old school. Thought we were going to have a drummer, but Ashish's car has been in the garage for the past three weeks, and they've not been able to to uh, to get here. And Hannah's working this week, unfortunately. We hope that their car will be sorted for next week, and they can be back with us. But let's sing this one. What a friend we have in Jesus! All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Let's stand as we as we sing this hymn. Let's have a let's have a prayer and, and seek God's blessing this afternoon. Father, we thank you that we can take it to you in prayer. 
We thank you that we can come before you at any point. If times are troubled, we can come to you in prayer. When times are good, we can come to you in prayer. And all the times in between, we can come and praise you and pray to you. Father, bless us today as we, we meet together. We thank you for everyone who's here. We think of all who are watching online and getting a blessing from, from through that ministry as well, Father. And we ask that you would be with each and every one of us today, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Okay. I said to you that we were going to go old school, right? We've gone even older school this week at Incy Wincy's. They sang a song that was uh, written in 1900. Uh, we're not going to sing that one. We'll leave that to a Thursday. Uh, that was a favourite of one of the ladies who used to come along uh, to Incy Wincy's, but who sadly passed away. Um, but that was her favourite song that she learned as a child. But I Y came to me last Sunday and says, do you know this song? And then she sang to me. Well, if any of you know I Y singing, I had to listen to it a couple of times to get what the, what the tune was. But this is going even, not even older school, but as old school as uh, Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. She says, do you know the song, The Lily of the Valley? I says, yes. I says, she says, well, can you sing it? I says, no, I can't sing it. I says, but I'll get someone else who can sing it. So, this was written in the 1940s, so it's nearly 80 years old, right? Now, I'll encourage you, well, I won't encourage you, I'll discourage you to go and listen to it on YouTube. There are loads of versions on YouTube. I listened to one last night, and I thought, this is quite nice. And I let Eunice here, and she says, you're not playing that. I was like, okay. So, I listened to her, I went, oh, we're definitely not playing that one. I listened to that one. So, we went through about eight or ten different versions of it. This is the one that we've ended up with. I hope you like it. <clears throat> Can you put the PowerPoint on, Eunice? And then we can get it to play. So the lily of the valley. Uh, I had a, I had quite a nice version of it, but uh, this is the one that, uh, if you don't like it, you can encourage your, uh, Eunice to... Uh, pick a different one next time so this is this is at the lily of the valley as I prayed there when times are hard uh, when times are difficult and uh, we can't see uh, the wood for the trees there's a, there's a line in this uh, in sorrow he's my comfort in trouble he's my stay and uh, I was going through a lot in the past few months uh, with family and uh, it went particular uh, purpose to her and uh, all of us have gone through difficulties in the in the past uh, years uh, with family as well. So uh, just have a look at the words, and uh, if you know it, then sing up and uh, sing along if you want uh, to this, the lily of the valley.
Jesus wants to be your friend. Will you let him? In the Sunday school, Eunice is often saying to the children, are you listening for God knocking at your heart's door? Asking to come in, not forcing his way in, but asking to come in. Jesus wants to be your friend. Will you let him? Or will you harden your heart like Pharaoh did against the children of Israel and say no? We're going to sing another one. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. So if you're able to stand for this, uh, please, please do so.
more than one. Here I am. I'm singing Majesty. Yeah. 
Please take your seats. <clears throat> I'm just going to have a prayer and uh, and then we'll have the next part of our, our series with Roger Carswell. He started that last week. Our God and Father, we come before you. We thank you for this time together that we can spend. Grateful we can sing majesty. Your grace has found me just as I am and I'm humbled. Father, we can't do anything other than accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and know that he is the reason that we are here. Roger is going to speak today about what must I do to be saved? What must I do in my life to make a difference and to change and to become part of your family? Father, bless us as we listen to this message this afternoon. Be with us, we pray. In your name. Amen. Uh, I trust you're having a very, very blessed summer and uh, you're having time with the Lord day by day to uh, read his word, the Bible, and to pray and to commune with God throughout the day. The Christian life is one of intimacy with God, isn't it? But Things don't always go well and they don't always go according to plan. And that was certainly the case in the life of the Apostle Paul. I love the biography of Paul. It's found, of course, in the book of Acts. So in the New Testament, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and then the book of Acts. Um, to be honest, there are, it's a book of Acts, but it's also <clears throat> a book of sermons. I think um, a whole load of sermons. They're, they're often in pricey form, but nevertheless, lots of messages and the gospel is time and time again explained. And there's a focus each time on the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and then the need to repent and believe. But of course, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, it may be the most wonderful message in the world. And it, um, it's certainly the most urgent message in the world, but it does cause controversy. Um, I was involved in a mission in my home church just two or three weeks ago and there was a children's mission going on at the same time. A family were invited and uh, the parents said, we don't want our children to have anything to do with a religious meeting. And at the moment, speaking to, I'm doing a mission in Derby and a teenage girl came yesterday and her parents said, well, you can go to that meeting as long as you don't become a Christian. Amazing, isn't it? The strange day and age in which we live. But it's always been like that. There's always been controversy and um, opposition to the gospel. So here's the Apostle Paul in Philippi, which is in Greece. Amazingly, I once spoke in Thessalonica at a conference and I was taken to Philippi. Of course, we imagine these nice romantic little villages that are now big, bustling, fairly dirty towns. But anyway, um, uh, I did go there on one occasion. But uh, Paul saw great blessing. He, um, it was there, for example, that uh, Lydia, the first convert in Europe, was a lady called Lydia. Uh, it was there that she was converted and there was a, a slave girl and she was demon possessed. But when she trusted Christ, of course, the people who owned her and owned her for all the strange things which she would do because she was demon possessed, lost their livelihood. And they complained to the magistrates, Paul and Silas were beaten and they were put in prison. I often think poor old Paul, whenever he arrived in a city, he must have asked, excuse me, do you know what the local prison's like? He didn't ask about the local hotel. I'll be there tonight. Will I be beaten up? Is the guard any good? Paul was always in bother, wasn't he? And um, he was in prison having been beaten and he was put into an inner cell. So it was, it was horrible. It was uh, dark and dingy, no doubt, and who knows what else. And, uh, and yet Paul and Silas in prison were singing praises to God. And uh, at midnight, there was this earthquake. There were a lot of earthquakes in um, um, in Philippi in that area but this was a big one and um, the prison bars broke the door opened and of course um, the prison guard 
assuming that the prisoners would have escaped, thought, you know, I don't want to live anymore because whatever punishment was coming to the, the prisoners would come to him if he'd let them go. And so he, he draws his sword and he's about to throw himself on his sword and commit suicide. Better to die than be humiliated by the Romans for whom he worked. But Paul and Silas, <laughs> they didn't exactly think, um, hmm, well, he deserves it or anything. No, 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 no. There's an attitude of love and grace and they shout out, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And the, the prison guard asks for a light and he goes in and he's the one who's trembling before Paul and Silas. And he comes out with this great question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And an even greater answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And what applies to you applies to your household. Well, the prison guard indeed did believe and was saved forgiven and he took Paul and Silas um, and he washed their home and he washed their, their wounds and he cared for them and it seems as though he and the whole family were converted to Christ and baptised. It's a great dramatic story. It's interesting because it contains within it a few sort of mistakes, wrong assumptions. And, and let's be honest, today, people have all sorts of wrong assumptions about Christianity. You know, they think it's about believing in God or going to church or just doing your best. Or to be honest, just believing and you invent whatever sort of God you want to invent. Well, I believe my God is real, my God is that, etc. And they've got strange views of God. It's, um, and, and so people have wrong assumptions. Well, there are some wrong assumptions being made in this particular passage. I want to think about three of them. The first one is uh, the magistrates and the, um, the, the authorities, and I suppose the prison or guard himself, they thought that prison would silence Paul and Silas that um, they wouldn't continue to speak if they were um, if they were in prison. <laughs> it didn't exactly silence them. They were singing. They were singing praise to God. And uh, I don't know what modern chorus or song they were singing, whether some ancient psalm, who knows, but they were singing praise to God. When a person becomes a Christian, God puts a new song in their mouth. Now, I have... I've been to a number of prisons and spoken at chapel services. Only once have I ever been in a prison cell. Uh, I, not, not that I've done anything wrong, but I went to visit somebody I knew and they actually allowed me to go into his cell. And uh, it was just a very confined space, no window at all. And I thought, wow, I don't know that I could do this. I could cope with this. I think my mind would just explode. And somebody I know is in prison in Scotland at the moment and he's in his cell, he's a sharp mind, but he's in his cell 23 and a half hours a day. How do you cope with that? But Paul and Silas were praising God and they took everything that came their way as mm, this is what God's purpose for us is. God had put a new song in their mouth and prison walls were not going to silence them at all. In fact, it has been the experience <clears throat> down through the centuries that time and again, Christians imprisoned for their faith have found God in a very, very special way. Of course, we think of John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He was in prison for 12 years, so he was allowed out um, at night, wasn't he? To, um, and, 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 oh, sorry, a day, and then had to go back at night uh, in the prison. Um, uh, I've got a quotation here from a, a martyr. His name was Algerius. He died in 1557. He was Italian, but he was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of his faith in Christ alone for salvation, he was imprisoned. He was imprisoned pending his execution. And indeed, that's where he was martyred. Listen to what he said. Who would have thought that in this dungeon I should find a paradise so pleasant in a place of sorrow and death, tranquility, hope and life, where others weep, I rejoice. Some of you may know the story of Samuel Rutherford who was imprisoned up in Aberdeen and again he found the cell was filled with the presence of God. They thought that prison would silence them, it didn't. They kept on singing and, of course, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, tough times do come and life is tough and it's very hard at the moment because we're seeing a rapid decline of any morality and spirituality and Christian presence in our land and the pressure is mounting on us, but we've still got something to sing about. Uh, we have a saviour who loved us, who gave himself for us, who's not only crucified bearing our sin, but risen from the dead and he's with us. 
and he's given us exceeding great and precious promises about now and about the future as well. They thought prison would silence them. Uh-oh. Secondly, there was another wrong assumption because they thought, well, say they, the prison guard thought, there's no longer any point to life. There was the earthquake, the prison bars broke, the gate opened. He just made the wrong assumption, as it happens, that the prisoners would have just escaped. But they hadn't. And he thought, well, if they've escaped, whatever punishment was coming to them will come to me. I'll probably be executed. I may as well just take my life without going through all the humiliation and suffering. What's the point of living? He wanted to give up. Of course, he was used to living by orders. He was a Roman soldier. He knew what discipline was and he knew how to, um, how to do what he was told to do. And when everything was taken from him beyond his control, well, what was the point to life? And, and sometimes it's very easy to think, what's the point of our lives? It's, is there any significance? Things go wrong. It's tough. It's challenging. Maybe it's just easier to die. I, every time I hear of a suicide, my heart sinks and I think, oh dear, have you passed from the troubles of this world into the far worse troubles of an eternity without God in hell? Now, that's not always the case. There are believers who have taken their lives as well. But it's never right, never, never right that we take our life. God is the uh, the giver of life and he's the taker of life there are some occasions where god has said it's right for others to take somebody's life but we're not talking about that at the moment we're talking about somebody saying i've had enough there's no more point to life but he was wrong because actually though this man had lived for many, so many years by orders hmm, he's now going to live by love he's going to find forgiveness salvation new life he's going to find a life of love from a savior who's loved him and given himself for him do you know sometimes when we're at the lo very very lowest we're on the brink of great blessing uh, what do they say before dawn we go to the there's the darkest part of the night and um, it's always the experience of christians that god has something more even if we think no he's given up on us uh, well this man was going to take his life Paul and Silas did their utmost to stop him. And then they said, look, we are here. And he didn't take his life. In fact, he was given new life by the Lord Jesus Christ. But then there's a third wrong assumption. Uh, he thought, and so many people do, that salvation was by what we do. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, of course, really, it's, well, there's nothing we can do. The Lord Jesus Christ has done it all. Every other religion is about people trying to do things. Don't do this, do do that, don't go there, do go here, uh, etc. And you might possibly get to God. We can never get to God like that. He's too vast for little us to get to. And he's too holy, too holy for sinful us to reach. God has taken the initiative and he's the one who's come down to us. It's a wonderful thing. The vast eternal God, this infinite being, big enough to become small and strong enough to become weak and God confines himself to a human body his little baby laid in a manger is God coming into the world in the person of Jesus Christ to reach and to rescue us and that's exactly what he did it's not what we do that saves us it's all what he has done that can save us heaven is not a reward for doing good heaven is a gift which Jesus purchased and he offers to all humanity it's not so much what we do, it's what we believe. And it's not so much what we do, it's what God has done. And it's not so much what we do, but who we know. In other words, if we know the true and the living God, hmm, we will be saved. And the answer came back, didn't it, straight away from, from Paul and Silas. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your life. I don't know whether you ever talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I find they have this little stall always well away from where anybody is and they don't want to talk to you. But anyway, I try to talk to them. And one of the things I've often asked, I learned it from a, a Southampton city missioner, oh, 40, 50 years ago. And one of the things I've often asked is, I say, if I was to ask you what must I do to be saved, what would you say? And they have two or three answers of things that you should do. And me being a little bit mischievous, I like to say to them as well, and anything else? And yes, they had a few more things. And then I say, do you know, that's not what Paul answered. And I take them to Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not what we do. All other religions are about works. 
Christianity is about God's work for us and in us. What a difference. If it's about my words, I mess up. I have wrong thoughts. I do wrong things. I say wrong. I'm not the person I should be at all. But if I'm relying on what Jesus has done, then, then alone will I be um, safe and secure. He thought that salvation was through works. No, it was through uh, the work that Christ accomplished on the cross. But let me just finish by saying, there's one thing that this prison guard did not get wrong. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He believed. Well, he didn't get that wrong. He put his trust in Jesus Christ. He asked Jesus who died for him and who rose from the dead to forgive him. He received forgiveness. He received salvation. He repented of his sin. He turned from that which was wrong and and looked to the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't get that wrong. I have never met anybody who has trusted Christ and is following him who's regretted trusting Christ and following him. So he didn't get that. Secondly, he obeyed. Uh, He did exactly what he was told to do by the Apostle Paul, and he didn't get that wrong. And then he was baptised. Now, I don't know what you think about being baptised, but um, talk to here about being baptised. I don't believe it's sprinkling of water on a baby. That's a religious ritual that people have made up. It's never found in the Bible. Now, baptism is something that comes after belief. It's a bit like... um, Well, a little Jewish baby boy would be born into an Israelite family and eight days later, the little boy would be circumcised. A person is born again by asking Jesus to forgive them and be their Lord and Saviour. They're born into God's family and afterwards they're baptised. Baptism doesn't make a person a Christian. Baptism is a sort of, well, I'm not wearing a badge, unfortunately, at the moment, but supposing I was wearing a badge saying I belong to a particular group. What does the badge say? It says I belong. Now, the badge actually doesn't make me belong, but it shows that I belong. Baptism doesn't make me a Christian, but it shows that I am following the Lord Jesus. It's the badge of discipleship. And a person is baptised when they go down into the water, and they're, they're sort of buried in the water only for a moment. Don't panic. And it's as if the old life is just being washed away. And then they come up out of the water and it's as if they've risen to newness of life. Now, that's what this, this, um, this Philippian jailer did. He obeyed by believing. And having be- believed, he obeyed by being baptised. We need to obey by believing. God commands all men, all women, all people everywhere to repent. He's given us other commandments which we've broken, but there's one we can keep if we repent, if we turn from our sin and ask the Lord Jesus to forgive us, then he will do just that. So he he, he obeyed and then he was baptised. Uh, in those days we were baptised more or less immediately nowadays we like to just make sure somebody really is believing and really is growing as a Christian well whichever is the right thing but it's important that we make sure we are right with God it's important we make sure we've truly believed and if you have believed then talk to one of the church leaders about being baptised if you haven't yet been baptised. And it's a wonderful occasion, isn't it? Because you can invite your friends to come and see and hear your testimony as to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. So the dramatic story in the book of Acts of this Philippian jailer. Ah, He made some wrong assumptions, but eventually got everything right. Because no matter what a mess we've made up of our, in, in our lives, if we will turn from our sin, and trust Christ, he makes all things new. Just a couple of days ago in the mission that I was, uh, I, I'm involved in at the moment, I interviewed David Hamilton, a UVF terrorist, a murderer, imprisoned in the maze uh, in Northern Ireland for murder. In fact, he was involved even in prison in murdering a, an opponent, a vile man. And he said, I know I'm going to hell. And when he began to think about God, because God spoke to him in a very dramatic way, when he began to think about God, he just thought, no, 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 I'm I'm, I'm too bad, I'm too bad. But he wasn't the jailer, he was the one who was jailed. But one night in his cell, he asked God to become his Lord and Saviour, and he made all things new. He was completely changed. 
It's a wonderful thing. And let me give you one illustration. Now, whether you believe this or not, I don't know. I can believe it. But if you don't, at least see the metaphor of it. He used to, well, he read a lot, but he also used to tattoo himself in prison. Awful tattoos. He had one of a naked woman down his arm. But when he was converted, he changed it into a dragon instead. Well, first of all, he put a bikini on her. And then he changed it into a dragon. But he had on the palm of his hand the letters S-E-X. And he was so so embarrassed by this tattoo and he prayed what he should do one day he's there washing his face in the sink and he puts his hands in the sink and that tattoo intact came to the surface of his skin and when he pulled the plug it went down the plug hole all the other tattoos remained but that one intact just went down interesting isn't it even if you don't believe that happened that i do the metaphor is that when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away and all things are made new. We're saved, and not just for time, but for all eternity. May you today pray to God and ask him to save you. God bless you.